this is very sad. I um, I don't need to mention names, but yesterday I was on this panel of other theologians, and one of the things that one of my brothers there um, didn't really like in my presentation, they said, you know, this is where we would disagree, is that he wanted to say that as far as he was concerned, according to that school of thought, the kingdom of God right now until Jesus returns is internal. I want to really emphasize that. The, the, in the New Testament, the kingdom is internal. So, I mean, what have we just been looking at here? And I, I was, in a sense, kind of flabbergasted that he would make such a categorical remark because, you know, there's just so much in the New Testament. What's pure religion? So go out there and visit the people who are hurting, the fatherless and afflicted, and so forth. It's to control your tongue. It's to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. You see, Christ doesn't settle for a part-time or a restricted reign as king. Jesus didn't come to this world and declare his kingship only to be told, well, Jesus, you can rule over some parts of my life, but in other areas, I'll take control. Thank you. Jesus doesn't settle for that kind of thing. He demands obedience from us in everything that we do. And the Bible tells us that his aim as the king is to subdue all resistance to that which stands against God. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us in verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 15, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. He must rule until everything that opposes him has been subdued. Now, just so we don't misunderstand, as I think some schools of theology do, I'm not claiming when I say that, that everyone's going to be saved. And I'm not claiming that everyone who obeys is going to do so from the heart. But I am saying that all opposition is going to be subdued. Now, those of you who have children probably realize sometimes you can get the compliance of your children, even though you know in their hearts they don't like it. Uh -huh. all right? You've subdued them, though. <laughs> right? And the Bible tells us Jesus is going to subdue all of his enemies. Okay. That isn't to say he's going to convert everybody. Everybody's going to obey because they like it. Some people may obey just because things go better when they obey. Some people may do it just because that's what they've been taught. And everyone will, Not everyone's going to love Jesus from the heart. But Paul tells us he's going to subdue all his enemies. So that all opposition in all areas of life eventually are going to be overcome by the king. So we pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done earth, even as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God, undeniably then, is this worldly and present tense. Its effects and its manifestation are to be seen not just in our inward lives, the saving of our souls, but also in our external conduct in the affairs of this world. Now, one last remark, and then you get to talk to me about this. In John 8, 36, you notice that Jesus assures Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And I said, well, Dr. Bronson, now, how can, you, uh, how can you say all these things? I mean, it sounded so good while you were saying it, but now, doesn't that verse disprove it all? Well, no, as a matter of fact, it doesn't. In John's Gospel, we have Jesus appearing before Pilate, whose concern is that he has a revolution on his hands. Of course, he does. He doesn't have any idea how, you know, how powerful and far extensive it's going to be. But he's worried that people are going to foment kind of, you know, geopolitical revolution. And Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world, or else my servants would fight. If my kingdom were like your kingdom, one that derives its authority from this world and operates according to the principles of this world, sure, we'd take up swords and we'd let you have it. But that's not the kind of kingdom I have. What does it say at the end of that verse? Jesus explains how his kingdom's not of this world. He says, my kingdom is not from here. And that's why we don't need to use earthly means and swords to get our way, Pilate. My kingdom's from above. And by the way, you notice how Jesus says to Pilate, and your rule is given to you from above. And that's why my being delivered to you will bring the greater condemnation. Because you answer to God too. But my kingdom's not of this world. I receive my rule from above. I'm a king from heaven. You know, if Pilate really understood that, he probably would have dismissed him as a madman, you know, kind of like, oh yeah, you're from outer space, right, Jesus? But Jesus, when he says, my kingdom's not of this world, does not mean to say my kingdom does not pertain to this world. What he's saying is my kingdom doesn't come from this world. It doesn't arise out of this world. 
I didn't go collecting a band of people, you know, and create this kingdom out of earthly resources. And we don't use earthly means. My kingdom's from above. Now, when people then look at this verse and say, well, then Jesus' kingdom shouldn't have anything to do with this world. I think they missed the point of Jesus' kingdom is from above. It has everything to do with this world because it's the creator from above who made this world and he rules over all. But I'm going to do a little apologetical work on this too. When people say Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, therefore it shouldn't have anything to do with this world, then I want to reply sometimes, well, then live according to what you're telling me. Be consistent. If Jesus' kingdom doesn't have anything to do with this world, then don't let it have anything to do with this world. And some of you maybe are getting the point, if it doesn't have anything to do with this world, well, then you shouldn't be preaching in this world. It doesn't have anything to do with this world. It shouldn't be gathering converts from this world. It shouldn't have anything to do with the way we live within the confines of the church. And shouldn't have anything to do with your prayer life in this world. As long as you're in this world, you can't have anything to do with the kingdom of Jesus Christ on that interpretation. And the reason I'm doing this is because that interpretation has done so much damage, but even the people who, who profess that, that that's what the Bible teaches, don't live that way. They know better in their heart of hearts. Jesus' kingdom does pertain to this world. That's why we send out missionaries in this world. That's why we have churches in this world. That's why we do deeds of mercy and love toward the afflicted and the poor in this world. Because Jesus' kingdom does pertain to this world. And all I want to point out is it pertains to all of it. Not just our special projects, not just our own individual desires or the way we've been brought up, but everything in this world is affected by the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Not your will be done in heaven instead of on earth, but let your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. 